Hi, I'm Gary Stearman. Today we have a guest who's an expert on the Shroud of Turin. And our guest expert is Russ Brialt. Many of you may have seen some of his work. Uh, we've had him at many of our conf conferences. And Russ, it's a pleasure to have you in the studio. Gary, it's just great to be back with you here. And uh, you know, I'm just uh, excited to be here. Now, I think anyone who has in the least studied uh, the Gospels has read about uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm looking at John uh, chapter 19, where Joseph of Arimathea comes and uh, he got permission to take away the body of Jesus. And uh, through a series of events, Jesus was wrapped in a very special shroud. Yes, he was. And that shroud is not like uh, anything that you might uh, imagine. I mean, the very structure of it, the construction of it, uh, means that, that it, it has a special meaning. Yes. Well, the, 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 the connection to Joseph of Arimathea is very important because, because he, because the scripture makes a point of telling us that he was a rich man and he was also a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he had, um, he had, uh, the, therefore he had access to the temple store. And so, when he purchased the linen shroud that Jesus would be wrapped in, and when you look at the shroud, it is a three to one herringbone pattern weave, very distinctive, very, very expensive, and therefore very rare. Doable in first century using first century loom technology, but expensive. Now, so in other words, the, the shroud is consistent with what the scripture would call fine twisted linen. Now, ah. fine twisted linen is what the high priest was supposed to wear b before he entered into the Holy of Holies. So, so I believe that Joseph of Arimathea purchased a linen cloth worthy of a high priest about to enter the Holy of Holies. That's the significance of the, of the manufacture of the shroud. The thing about the shroud to me uh, is that, and, and by the way, Russ, I think you're better at, than anyone at, at bringing all these myriad details together. When you put together the details that come to the present day and the Shroud of Turin, it takes you on a long track back and hundreds of details. And when those details all come together, it's jaw dropping. You reach a point where you have to say either Christ is real or, well, I'm interested in something else. You, you must either accept it or turn away. Uh, the evidence, the, uh, the sheer magnificence of all the details of the shroud become uh, quite clear in a short time if you devote any time at all to looking at it. Well, first of all, you just look at how unique it is. In other words, you have a 14-foot long linen cloth. It's 14 feet long, three and a half feet wide. It's long, narrow cloth with the front and back image of a man, an apparently crucified man. And so right there, that stands totally unique in, in, in all of art. Now, one of the things we have to look at with the shroud is always the either-or proposition. Either the Shroud of Turin is the authentic borough shroud of Jesus, or it's not. And if it's not, well, then what is it? Well, then it must be the work of an artist. If that's the case, then there must be some kind of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, stain, something on the cloth to account for the image, but there's not. And so when you look at the, so when you look at the, at the, at just the frontal image of the man, you see clearly a man with long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, flattened nose. We see blood stains all around the head from an apparent crown of thorns. 
Looking down further, we see you now the, the, the most prominent thing you see on the shroud is a series of burns and patches from a fire in 1532. So the image appears to lie in between these two parallel lines, which are nothing more than burns and patches. Uh, but, but when you look further down, you see we, we see a side wound. We come back down further, we see the arms are crossed over the, over the pelvis like this with a nail wound in the wrist. Here, this is the exit wound, flip it over, had to be in the wrist, and now we know through medical technology that the nail going through the palm of the hand will not hold the weight of a crucified man. It would, it would rip through the fleshy part in between the fingers. The nail had to be in the wrist, and that's exactly where we see it on the shroud. But what happens when a nail goes through the wrist? It cuts nerves and tendons, and it causes the thumbs to jerk into the center of the palm. And at either point on the shroud image where thumbs could be visible, there are no thumbs visible. So all that is anatomically accurate. And then we see blood down the man's arms from when the body was in this position on the cross. And then later, after taking down from the cross, they had to break rigor mortis, bring those arms down and tie them with a strip to keep them down. And then, which is why we see blood coming down the arms here and then pooling under the elbow and dropping to the ground. We do not see blood here, but just coming down the forearms, hmm. which would be consistent with someone who died in, that, in, in, the, in, the, in the position of crucifixion. And then we see the legs, and then, and then you know, so um, every, all of the wound patterns, because, you know, the, the, a lot of people may ask, well, how do you know it's Jesus? It could be the shroud of anybody. Well, that's where, because we have, at the end of the day, I always say, we can't prove the shroud absolutely to be the shroud of Jesus. We don't have the DNA of Jesus. But at, at, what, at least we could do is compare the gospel account with what the shroud shows. And there's nothing that's out of place. Everything about the shroud is perfectly consistent with the gospel account, even right down to the side wound, which shows blood that flowed after death because there's the clear separation of blood and blood serum, and that only occurs when the blood is no longer circulating, which would be perfectly consistent with what happened to Jesus. Remember, both of the thieves on either side of Jesus were still alive around four in the afternoon. The Roman soldiers came by with a large wooden mallet weighing about 15 pounds, shattered the bones under the knees, can't stand on broken legs, die from asphyxia, the inability to breathe, right? But so, but then it says, but when they came to Jesus, they noticed he was already dead. Therefore, they did not break yeah. his legs. But Joseph of Arimathea had gone to Pontius Pilate to request the, the body so he could, you know, get, you know, place the body in his own tomb. And so before they could release the body to Joseph, they had stabbed him in the side to make sure he was dead. And so, and then the, the biggest anomaly of all is the fact that you have... Uh, well, I may, may, may back up a step. Why do we have a man who's so brutally scourged, about 120 scourge marks to be counted on the body, brutally scourged, and yet crucified at the same time? You see, usually you were scourged, or, and you scourged and released as a form of punishment, or you were crucified as a form of execution. And the Romans generally did not scourge you horribly uh, be, be, you know, if, if their intent was to crucify you. Uh, and, and that's because they expected you to stay alive all day long on the cross. It was, it, was, it was all part of the spectacle of crucifixion. And so now we have to question, why was Jesus scourged so badly? And the answer is because Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, didn't want to kill Jesus. And he didn't, he didn't think he was worthy of capital punishment. So the first thing he did, he sent him to King Herod. Herod sent him back, right? And then he tried to trade Barabbas, and that didn't work. And so finally he has him scourged to within an inch of his life, thinking that maybe when this bloodied hulk of a man came walking back into the courtyard, maybe they'd say, well, okay, that's enough. You don't have to kill him. That's not what happened. So in spite of being scourged, they still wanted him dead. Now, the last and probably most significant thing relates back to the cloth, which you mentioned earlier is how is it that you have a man who's clearly, clearly died a criminal's death, he was crucified and scourged, and yet he's wrapped in a rich man's shroud? This doesn't happen. 
In fact, most people who were crucified yeah. were thrown into a common grave. And so, and so here we, and so this is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Isaiah 53 says he, and that, that, that he will make his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. And Russ, the more you talk about this, the more you add detail upon detail upon detail, and when you're through, it has to be what you see. Yeah. And, and I'm holding, still holding up my Bible here. Uh, this is John 20. <laughs> And uh, there's this famous picture of, uh, we, of Peter and, and John. They both ran together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher and stooping down looking in saw the linen clothes lying. And so that's what we're talking about. Yes. And there it is, the story. And when you look at the shroud today, you might think to yourself, this is the very piece of cloth that Peter gazed upon and said, what's going on here? Which, that staggers the mind. And, and John won, Peter went in first, John went in after him and saw and believed. Yeah. And believed what? Well, believed that he had risen or at least believed that something extraordinary had occurred. You know, remember the allegations in the first century was that someone had stolen the, the, the body, right? So if the body had been stolen, what would you have seen? I think either you would have found that cloth balled up and thrown into a corner, or more likely than, than not, why would you unwrap a corpse? Right. You just take the whole thing and run. And so when Peter and John went to the tomb, they, they would have seen nothing had the body been stolen. So what did they see? They saw that linen cloth laid out on that stone slab exactly the same way it was put there on Good Friday. Nothing moved, nothing disturbed, except the, except the cloth had just collapsed on itself. You see, we have the advantage of living in the 21st century. We can watch reruns of Star Trek. Was this, <laughs> was this a beam me up Scotty moment? Yeah. I don't know, you know, but now it's interesting. So. It's the linen cloth was the first piece of evidence that Jesus had risen from the, the dead. Now it's curious though, people would say, well how come the scripture doesn't mention any, mention an image on the linen shroud? And this, you know, I don't know, maybe the, maybe, maybe the image wasn't apparent for a while. You know, some of the, some of the experiments we've done using, uh, using radiation as a possible cause of the image, it is, a, it is a latent image, it doesn't show up immediately. And so, um, but what's interesting though, from the sixth century, this is called the Mozarabic Rite of Holy Week. This is the way that they, this is liturgy that is brought to Spain uh, from, uh, from, from Egypt. And it's, it translates that same verse of scripture this way. Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the recent imprints of the dead and risen man on the linens. Hmm. That's 1,500 years old. Does it go all the way back to first, to, to first century? I don't know. All I know is that, the, is that it was the linen cloth itself, not the empty tomb, it was the linen cloth lying there that was the first piece of evidence that Jesus had risen from the dead. And it's a photograph. What can you say? And that's where the story really gets interesting. And uh, you have to, we have very little time today compared with what we actually need to tell this story, which is amazing in its detail. That's what uh, blows me away about the shroud. And my first, uh, if you will, encounter uh, with the shroud was years ago the old National Geographic yeah. article and it caused me to start wondering and and it's been a conversation piece and I don't think that's an accident I think God wanted people to question themselves <clears throat> could this thing be real if so does it mean that Jesus was real and that what he did was real and therefore he really did come to save man on earth and how do I react to this? And that's the big question. Right, right. Well, you know, the, um, the shroud is the most analyzed artifact in the world, been subjected to thousands of hours of scientific analysis. Um, you know, the image is not the result of artistic substances, no, no visible trace of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, or stain. And so, but what, what's intriguing is what is the shroud? Now, 
There are four words that are commonly used to describe what the shroud is. It's called a relic. It's called an artifact. It's called a mystery. It's called a symbol. And all those words are fine. But they, it, says, but they, it seems like, you know, it really doesn't tell you very much. So I got to thinking, this is a few years ago, and I said, there has to be another concept. So I searched the scriptures for all the words that would describe what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And there are four of them. We have been bought, purchased, redeemed, ransomed. Ransom is a word Jesus used. Hmm. And you put all those four words together, and what are they? Those are all words of transaction. A transaction has occurred. A payment has been made on our behalf. And so I've got to thinking, well, now wait a minute. When you go to a store and you purchase anything, what does the cashier always give you? A receipt. And what is a receipt? A receipt is a record of the transaction. It's a proof of purchase. What's on the receipt? The price you paid. And so when and so when Peter and John <clears throat> ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, what did they see? They saw the receipt. They saw the record of the transaction. And when they opened it up, what did they see? They saw the price that was paid. And not only is the shroud a receipt, it's an itemized receipt documenting everything that was paid. Crown of thorns, scourging all over the body, wound in the side, nemos in the wrist and the feet, bruises on the face, abrasions on the shoulders and on the <clears> knees. <throat> Everything that was paid to purchase our salvation is on the receipt. And that's, I think, is the significance of the shroud. Well, and when you say transaction, to telestai, it is finished on the cross. In other words, that word if you go back and really examine it, and, and there are books written about uh, the words of Jesus on the cross, but that phrase, to tell, to tell us that I paid in full, it is finished, speaks of a completed transaction. And as you have so eloquently said in, in your DVD productions, and by the way, really terrific, uh, not only was payment in full, but it was payment in detail, mm, yes. rigorous detail, yes. which that's what blows me away. And that's what you're so good at showing people. Yeah. Yeah. The it's it's a receipt, um, which is what the blood stains represent. The whole pattern is 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 proof of purchase, yes. proof of payment. And but then it's also a promissory note of that which is to come. Because the image represents a future event. The image that's on the cloth is the result of the resurrection. So the whole pattern of bloodstains is evidence for the crucifixion. The image is the resurrection and that represents, and so the shroud in my view, represents a future event. In other words, remember Jesus is called the first fruits of the resurrection. If he's the first fruits, then that, then that means we are the rest of the fruit that comes later at the, at the end of the age. And then when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 and says, he says, listen, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. He's talking about a future event. It hasn't even happened yet. But this is exactly what happened to Jesus in the tomb instantaneous transformational event involving light, no doubt, had to be light. In fact, that's what I think is the cause of the image, is light, and which is consistent with the gospel. Remember, no eyewitnesses to what happened to Jesus in the tomb, but we have clues, Mount of Transfiguration. Before the crucifixion, Peter, James, and John at the bottom of the hill. Jesus goes up to the top of the hill and he's transfigured before them and his face shines like the sun itself and his clothing became dazzling light. So Jesus is transformed into a being of light before the crucifixion. And then how does he appear to Saul who becomes Paul on the road to Syria, right? And right. it says he was blind. He, he, you know, Jesus appears in a blinding flash of light so bright that Paul is blinded for three days. And so if you just did a straight Bible study and asked what happened to Jesus 
the split second his soul came zooming back into that lifeless body, I think you'd have to assume that there was an explosion of light and then gone. Wow. <clears throat> well, listen, you need to go further. And the way to do it is to obtain uh, some of Russ's DVDs. Uh, and they're all uh, titled Shroud Encounter with Russ Briault. Uh, could the Shroud of Turin be a receipt? Wonderful, wonderful production. Secrets of the Man Clothed in Linen, Shroud Encounter. I could go on, but uh, we're going to pause and uh, you'll find out how you can obtain Russ's DVDs. As you can tell, Russ Briault has quite a different perspective on the mysterious linen cloth that has puzzled scholars and scientists for centuries. And Russ's mind is not an object or a graven image to be worshipped. Instead, Russ likes to call it the receipt of the resurrection. He said it well, bought, purchased, redeemed, and ransomed. And wouldn't it be just like Jesus to leave behind undeniable proof of his resurrection that can't be duplicated, copied, or imitated by any man today? If the shroud was a forgery, where are all the other shrouds? Instead, we find just this one. What we see here is physical evidence of resurrection power. A nuclear explosion of sorts took place on resurrection morning and it left behind an image of a crucified man that matches the biblical account perfectly. Can you imagine witnessing that moment in time when Jesus rose from the grave? We believe the man on the shroud is Jesus of Nazareth. Today, our special offer includes the very best of Russ's teachings on this fascinating subject. The Shroud of Turn package includes four DVDs, each one dealing with a different aspect of this ancient relic. The discounted package includes his latest DVD, Could the Shroud of Turin Be a Receipt? Secrets of the Man Clothed in Linen, An Holy Obsession When Hitler Tried to Steal the Shroud, and an hour-long live presentation by another world-renowned Shroud expert, Barry Schwartz. When you order the Shroud of Turin package, we also have two bonus DVDs we'd love to send you for free from the Shroud Encounter series. The DVD, What If?, provides the answers to all the common objections to the Shroud, and CSI Jerusalem is an investigative look into the Shroud from a scientific and biblical perspective. We'd love to send you these two free bonus DVDs when you order the Shroud of Turin package for your gift of $75 or more to Prophecy Watchers. And we'll include shipping for all six DVDs anywhere in the USA. Just call the toll-free number on your screen or go to our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to stand with us today. Help us keep this important end times ministry coming to your home each week. These six DVDs represent what we believe are the most comprehensive studies ever presented on the burial cloth of Jesus. Evidence is presented, objections are answered, and we're given the inside information from experts who've been studying the Shroud for over 30 years. Once again, we enjoy bringing you the special guests and deep studies that you will likely never hear about in church. What we find fascinating at Prophecy Watchers is that moment in time when Jesus experienced that one-of-a-kind resurrection power. Will we experience that same exact nuclear event at the rapture of the church? Will you be joining us on the day Jesus takes his church home and eternity begins? We believe that day is not very far away. Thanks for watching today, and as always, we hope today's program was a blessing and an encouragement to you. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I hope that you'll take advantage uh, of that offer because you'll be, I think, surprised. You'll be, I, if you're like me, you'll be stricken with awe. How could things have happened the way they did? Well, of course. God had his hand in it. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ does things in a superhuman way, and nobody has documented uh, that way as well as you have, Russ. There's just no doubt about it. I love it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's such an exciting topic. You know, because it's, it's not that I'm interested 
in ancient linen cloths. You know, <laughs> you know. I mean, as as right. someone once said, if this was the shroud of Julius Caesar, no one would care. But because this represents the 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 whole essence of the shroud, is is is, and I, I really. I hope people don't get hung up. I, 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 don't, I don't know if the shroud's authentic or not, but I sure have a hard time thinking that this is the result of some medieval artist who predated Leonardo by several hundred years. We don't know who, we don't know who he is, we don't know how he did it, and he never did anything else. But I have to have you uh, address this one question, and, and you go into it so beautifully in your DVDs, and that is, uh, how was that image put on that cloth? The cloth is real, it's beautiful, the image is real, <clears throat> but there's not a paint pigment drop anywhere. It the, wasn't painted. No, the image, when you look at it under a microscope and do the science, the image is a result of an accelerated dehydration and oxidation of the cellulose fibers composing the linen cloth made out of flax but only in those areas immediately surrounding the body. So the image is essentially a discoloration of the cloth with something having brought about this rapid uh, um, dehydration and oxidation. So the question is, what is that? What caused that to what happen? Caused it? And the image is purely superficial, affects only the top one to two microfibers of the cloth. Now, not threads. Each individual thread is made up of about 200 microfibers. What could have caused that? And, and so which yeah. is what causes people to speculate, as I do, on energy, some kind of energy mechanism. 2011, researchers with the ENEA, this is the European Agency for New Technologies, were, have been experiment, published in a peer-reviewed journal, um, experimented with, with high-energy eczema ultraviolet lasers. These are powerful lasers. And they determined that a 40 nanosecond burst 40, a nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So 40 nanosecond burst. Yeah. You can't blink your eyes that, 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 that fast. Uh, against a control sample of linen, achieves the very same depth and coloration as we see on the shroud. And I'm saying, now that's cool. That is. So because remember, we already talked about that 1 Corinthians 15. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, Maybe a, maybe a 40 nanosecond flash, you know? I mean, so I think the shroud is a preview of coming attractions. It speaks to a historical event, the literal physical resurrection of Jesus. It speaks the in the now, the shroud is a receipt for the price that was paid. Right. In the future, it's a promissory note saying, get ready, this is coming, the shroud, because there's a lot of people that would, that would poo-poo your thoughts about Jesus coming back again, but you know what? The shroud testifies to that very thing. You know, the shroud says, can you believe in the unbelievable? And, it's, um, and the shroud is a testament to that. And when he appears, it's going to be in a brilliant flash of instantaneous light, right? Amen. <laughs> sure will. I'm looking forward to it. It may be soon. Maybe soon. <laughs> <laughs> Russ Brial, you must see uh, the Shroud Encounter DVDs, and I hope you do. I'm Gary Stearman. Russ, thanks for being with us. Uh, let's, let's do this again. My pleasure. And I want you to keep watching, folks, and really watching. We are. <laughs>